morning and welcome to Hold the Hoop. This is our weekly message. This message this morning is entitled, Take Off the Blinders. And it's found in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1 through 3. And it says, Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At, at that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Now the first thing that I want you to notice is, is the second sentence. In the first or the second part of the sentence in, in, in the first verse. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent visions. In those days, what days? What what days is the scripture talking about? It's talking about the days under Eli's um, ministry or the end of Eli's ministry. So, what was going on? Why were they, why was there no frequent vision? If it was no frequent vision in those days, then it would stand to reason that it was frequent visions in days prior. But now, there was no frequent visions. So, what has happened? What, what, what happened to, to bring about such a change? You know, whatever it is, whether it's, it's culture, meaning the way that, that we do things here, whether it's our goals, their, their, um, whether it's our priorities, whether it's vision, it all stems from one person, and that is the leader. And again, it doesn't matter whether it's ecclesiastical, which means the church, or whether it's secular, the society that, that we live in, it all reflects from the real leaders, who, whoever is in charge of policy. Those are the ones who set the culture. Now, this is true whether it's in a church setting or whether it's in a workplace, whether it's in a corporate world, whether it's even in the home, it's from the leader. The leader sets the, the, the culture of that family, of that organization. And that organization can be judged by its leader and the leader's belief. So, with that said, we would have to look to Eli to get some clues on what was going on. So the first thing we want to notice is that Eli's eyes had grown dim. This is a true description of both spiritual and his physical vision. Eli's spiritual eyes were no longer seeing the things of God. He no longer had discernment as the high priest, the leader of God's people, and the man of God. First, I want us to take a look at how, how Eli just glossed over his son's sins. His sons were, were priests ministering at the tent of meeting. But they were demanding the best meat. And they wouldn't even wait for the meat to cook. They would send their servants out and, uh, and they would jug the meat. Uh, or the, the way that, that it should happen is that they, they would jug the meat uh, with, with a two-pronged fork. And whatever chemo is what um, was for the priests. But they wanted the best and they wouldn't even wait for it. They, they, they went out there and they, they said, if you don't give it to us, we'll take it by force. They were having sex with the women at the tent of meeting. And Eli's boys were going on really ridiculous. And this is what God thought about the situation. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 12 through 14. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have, have spoken concerning his house, from beginning to end, 
and I declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons was blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. I believe um, Eli's spiritual eyes began to grow dim when he started turning a blind eye to what his sons were doing. When he began to gloss over and, and make light of, uh, of their sin and did not restrain them, his eyes then began to grow dim, his spiritual eyes. See, you cannot keep your hands from getting dirty while playing with pigs. So Eli, uh, uh, he, he then was, uh, was judged because he did not restrain his sons and, um, for their sins. What I mean is, you have to be very careful who you align yourself with. The things that they stand for, the things that they support, it will become the things that you stand for, the things that you support. You're giving your amen to the things that they do. Therefore, if you strongly support a political candidate, for, for instance, you better make sure that their views are your views and that what they stand for, that you stand for. You cannot stoke the fire and not smell like smoke. Second, I want you to look with me at the first chapter of 1 Samuel. It tells a story of a man whose name was Elkanah. Uh, he was from, from the hill country of, of Ephraim. His wife's name was Hannah. In fact, Elkanah had two wives, Hannah and Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. And, but the thing is that Hannah was Elkanah's favorite wife, although she had no children. And he would give her the best of everything. They, they would make the, this family would make the pilgrimage to, to Shiloh, uh, where the tent of meeting was, for, for the annual sacrifice. They would do this year in, year out. Every year they, they would do this. But this one particular pilgrimage, after being taunted by, by Penana, Hannah went to pray about her situation. And Eli was sitting there watching and observing her. Let's pick it up in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 9 through 18. Well, we're, we're not going to read the, all, all the verses, but we're, we'll skip through. After they had eaten and, and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the, on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was highly distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. Now we're going to skip down to verse 12. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart. Only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, How long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah uh, answered, no, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman. For all along I have been speaking out of the great anguish and, and vexation. Then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the Lord of Israel grant you your petition that you have made to him. And she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Although Eli was sitting there, he was watching her, was, he, he was observing what it was that she was doing, he had become so comfortable and so spiritually blind that he no longer had the spiritual discernment to see that Hannah was in great distress in her spirit. This, for, for a man of God, this is, is possible because if we look in the fourth chapter of 2 Kings, Elisha 
gave the Shonamite woman a miracle baby. When, <coughs> sorry, when the baby had grown to a young boy, he died in her arms. She laid him on Elisha's bed and went to look for Elisha. When she found him on Mount Carmel, she grabbed hold of his feet and Gehazi, Elisha's servant, who was spiritually blind, came and pushed her away. But this is what Elisha said. 2 Kings chapter 4, <laughs> verse, verse 27. He said, Leave her alone, for she is bitter distress, and the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. So even though God had hidden the reason or the cause of the woman's great distress from Elisha, he still had a spiritual discernment to know she was anguished in her spirit. She was distressed in her spirit. Something that Eli no longer possessed because his eyes had grown spiritually dim. Today's churches, or church to today, no longer have spiritual discernment. Why? Because we are too caught up in, in the political and social agenda without even realizing that it is designed to divide and conquer us. They divide us on race. They divide us on politics. They divide us on religion. They divide us on everything that they can divide us on and we let them divide us. We no longer fight for unity. What would happen, do you think, what would happen if the church would put aside all of our differences and just get together as one body, as one person, with one thing in mind, praying about our situation? Just like the bread is one loaf, we pray as one body. The book of Genesis tells us what God himself said about unity of people. He said that it is impossible to stop people who are united. Listen to this. Right after the flood, the people were moving westward and they came to a plain, the land of Shinar, and they settled there. They became comfortable and decided to rebel against God's mandate to repopulate the earth. They say they're going to build a city here, make a name for themselves, and build a tower in it. A tower that would reach up into heaven. Look at what God said about their undertaking. Genesis chapter 11, verse 6 and 7. He said, And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Nothing, nothing will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. God said that nothing will be impossible for them if they are united with one goal, with one mission. This is why our enemies divide us so that they can conquer us. But church, we need to get together. We need to stand united as one before it's too late. There's nothing that can stop a praying church who is united in thought, united in action, united in one mission. So that's why God had to Divide them. Because nothing would be impossible. And nothing will be impossible for us, the church of God, united together. The church of Jesus Christ, united together. But let's get back to Eli. Eli had lost his spiritual discernment because he lost his spiritual eyesight. Because he became too comfortable where he was at. Not only that, but he had grown spiritually fat and spiritually lazy as well. There's in in um 
in 1 Samuel, it talks about that, that there came a time when, when Israel went to war with the Philistines. And Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, went to war as well. And they took the Ark of the Covenant to war with them. The Philistines whooped the Israelites, even though they had the Ark. They, they beat them down, and, Phil, uh, and the uh, Israelites fled, and the Ark of God was captured. And the Philistines took it to their city, Ashdod. Now a man from the tribe of Benjamin, who was at, 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 at the battle, he, he, he ran all the way to Shiloh and told Eli the news, how the Israelites had fled before the Philistines, how his two sons were dead. And then he told them the ark of God was captured. And here is what happened when Eli heard that the ark of God was captured. 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 18. It says, as soon as he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell over backwards from his seat by the side of the gate, and his neck was broken, and he died. For the man was old and heavy. He had judged Israel 40 years. The Bible describes Eli as a heavy man, but he had become spiritually heavy as well. Why do I say that? Look at 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 29. God speaking to, to, to Eli. <clears throat> he said, Why then do you scorn my sacrifices and my offerings that I commanded for my dwelling and honor your sons above me by fattening yourselves on the choicest parts of every offering of my people Israel? God was not pleased with Eli, and he brought judgment down on Eli and his sons. He said that they were fattening themselves. They were spiritually fattening themselves on, uh, on these offerings. And, and God said that judgment would start at his house with his people. So we better get our act together and start seeking God. We better start calling sin sin and stop playing around with those who want to kick God out of our country, want to kick God out of our, out of our schools, want to kick God out of our government. Some people even want to kick God out of his church. We better stop promoting political correctness agenda and start <coughs> promoting God's agenda. The scripture says that Eli was lying down in his own place. The, the uh, NIV says he was lying down in his usual place. For, Le for Eli, it was business as usual. He was in his own place, which, which was his usual place. He sat in the same spot. He did the same things. He had gotten comfortable where he was at. And the church today has gotten comfortable as well. And when that happens, we can easily slip into lukewarmness. We lie down in our own place. We make our own way in life. We do our own thing. The church has, has turned like Eli, having our own place. We need to find out where God is. Where, what God is doing and who he's doing it through and join in with them and come out of our own place and get a place where God is. We've got to go where God is and we've got to join in with what God is doing. Now let's take a look at Samuel in contrast. Verse 1 tells us that the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli, or under Eli's supervision. So even though all of that was going on with Eli, the head, God did not let the lamp of God go out. Remember Elijah? After he had killed 450 of Baal's priests 
on, on, on Mount Carmel, and then he prayed for rain, and the rain came, and then Jezebel was upset because he, um, he, he had killed all, all of the priests of Baal, and she wanted Elijah dead as well. He felt so depressed that he claimed that he was the only one left, and they wanted him dead as well. But God did not let his lamp go out then either. The lamp of God was still burning. He said that he had reserved for himself 7,000 that did not bend the knee to Baal, or whose mouth had not kissed him. God will never leave himself without a witness in the earth. So while Eli was in his own place doing his own thing, the boy, Samuel, was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Now the ark of God represents the presence of God. Samuel was lying down in the presence of the Lord God Almighty. The church today doesn't seek the presence of God anymore. We, we don't spend time in all night prayer. We, 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 we no longer have prayer meetings that, that what the old people used to say, pray through. We don't have that anymore. The church and I have become lovers of self. They're too caught up in celebrities. The rich and famous. They're too caught up in football and other sports. And I'm not saying that, 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 that sports is wrong or football is wrong. But when you can quote more statistic or sports statistic than you can scripture, then just might be something might be wrong with that. God had to call Samuel two times. And two times Samuel had to run to Eli before Eli realized that it was God calling. Eli was in his own place doing his own thing when he should have been in God's presence. When you're in God's presence, God will reveal his plans to you. Look at Amos chapter 3 verse 7. Amos chapter 3 verse 7. For the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secrets to his servants, the prophets. His secrets, or in other words, his plans. God is always looking for one man or one woman who will stand in the gap, who will intercede for a people, who will intercede for a nation. We need to turn off the TV more. And get in God's presence more. We need to turn our plates over and, and, and fast and pray more often. These are hard times that we're living in. These are perilous times. The nations are in lockdown. We're living in the last days, people. And God is still looking for, for someone, one man or one woman, to stand in the gap. And so... I'm asking you this. I'm putting a challenge here. Would you consider standing in the gap? Fast and pray for your family that they may be safe, that they may be saved. Fast and pray for your country that, that we may get back our economy. Pray for an end to this COVID-19. Fast and pray for the high-level corruption to be exposed. Fast and pray because we want Jesus back in our government. We want Jesus back in our schools. We want Jesus back in our homes. We want prayer. We want Bible reading. And if you don't know who Jesus is, you can't. If you don't know him as Lord and Savior, all you got to do is to ask. Ask him to come into your, your life. Ask him to forgive you of your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. Cleanse you from all unrighteousness. All you have to do is to say, Father, forgive me for I have sinned. I'm no longer worthy be called your son. I'm no longer worthy to be called your daughter.
for I have sinned. Forgive me of my sins and make me a child of God. In Jesus' name. Amen. And if you pray that prayer, God is faithful. He will forgive you of your sin. He will cleanse you from unrighteousness. Then what you have to do is to get a Bible. Read your Bible every day. Spend time in prayer every day. Join a church, a Bible-believing church, who still believes that Jesus is Lord, still believes in the way of holiness, still believes that Jesus is coming back soon for his children, still believes that we have to live a certain way, that when he returns, he will find us waiting and worthy. So if you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been Hold to Hope. My name is Kenny Yates. Be blessed.